Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the HJ Bionet Seminar Series. We run uh, a webinar every month uh, by every third Wednesday, I think, just before the end of the month. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the April webinar to be presented by Dr. John Embler, who's a bioinformatician based at CG Africa, which is based at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Today's title is Creating and Using Genome Graphs with Gender as you can see on, on the slides right now. Um, the webinar is going to be for about 40 to 50 minutes, uh, where John is going to be giving us a presentation. And at the end, we're going to have a time for question and answer and discussion. So please, if you have a question, type it in the chat box. Or if you have a burning question, you can raise your hand using an icon on top. There's a human being, uh, or rather an icon that looks like a human being with his, with his hands raised. So just to make sure that we don't disturb, I'm going to kindly ask that one, Mute your mic if you're not speaking. Two, if you want to speak, rather type your question and I'll be reading it for you or John will read it himself. And thirdly, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand to make sure that we have some order and that we don't just type speak up. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read the abstract. I've sent out the ad and if you want to read the, the abstract, I can send it to you. Um, by the way, at the end, I'm going to be sending out the slides. John has agreed that I can share the slides with everybody. And I'm going to be giving the link to the recording as well because we actually keep um, uh, a channel with all our webinars that we've had held so far on a YouTube channel. So I can also send that out after the webinar as well. However, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, to hear John, or rather Dr. John Embler speak uh, today on gene graphs. I'm just going to quickly say a bit of his biography. Uh, Dr. John Embler is a bioinformatician at CG Africa, uh, and he has three areas of research focus, which are developing tools and pipelines, uh, providing support for researchers at the Institute, which is CG Africa, as well as teaching the next generation of bioinformaticians. Dr. John's research is primarily functional, uh, in functional genomics, in using next generation sequencing or NGS data for short, along with available knowledge of gene interaction networks and pathways to better understand pathogenicity. He works on a broad range of organisms important for human health, including mycobacterium, uh, tuberculosis, and HIV. And in the past, he has also worked on three key patho pathogens, especially uh, fungal genomes. John, thank you so much for taking time out to give this highly anticipated talk, uh, which is being attended by people across the African continent. So, John, please go ahead and give your, your presentation. Cool. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you very much for the opportunity for me to come and present some of my work here today. Um, I hope everyone is having a, a good day today um, with everything that's happening around the world. And once again, thank you for taking the time out to join us for this presentation. I hope you find it informative and that you come away with um, some um, new information and maybe some um, some tools that you want to use. Um, so the uh, bit of background, uh, you know, the, the setting for this talk is we're going to be talking a lot about reference genomes. Um, so reference genomes, uh, anyone that's been working um, with sequencing has had to uh, work with them, either for um, aligning against to do variant calling or to help do de novo sequencing. And generally speaking, reference genomes are, um, are around to answer certain core questions. What is the difference between isolate A and B? Why is this one bacteria more pathogenic than another? Why is it resistant to certain antibiotics? Um, and often we use variant calling to answer those questions. Sometimes we just have a question of what is organism C like? We might have a newly discovered organism and we want to know um, what pathways it has, what capabilities it has. And by using something like genome assembly, we can then take the genes from that assembly, blast them against the database, and start to understand a bit of what an organism is able to do. Um, and then also for phylogenetics, where we want to understand the relationship between different organisms. So which one has, um, which is the ancestral um, state of a certain gene, which organisms have been around for longer, um, and maybe information about the rate of change within a specific species. 
how quickly they're mutating. Um, the thing is with the reference genomes is they come with a lot of limitations. Um, one well-known one is reference allele bias, which is often a problem with the human genome where because the standard reference genome only has one allele at a given locus, any reads containing the alternate allele are less likely to map. So you get this overestimation of the frequency of the reference allele in a population. Um, and the other problem is that it's not always the closest organism to whatever you're investigating. We often have this problem with bacterial genomes where the most commonly used reference genome is actually quite distantly related to the organism that we're looking at. So normally what you'll be doing is you'll be taking your reads shown here in red and aligning them to your reference genome. And at the end of the day, you normally end up with a number of unmapped reads. And this is normally an artifact of the fact that your standard reference genome that everyone uses in the field, because it's more distantly related, it has a couple more mutations relative to the isolate that you're investigating, where another organism that might be closer phylogenetically will show fewer variants. So what we're seeing here is, first of all, you're mapping, the success of mapping reads to a reference is related to how closely, is yeah, relational to how closely related your reference genome is to the isolate that you're investigating. And this becomes very important for interpretation as well, where you might have variants that are called against a distantly related genome where there's more variants than you'd get if you were looking at one that's closer phylogenetically. So if you're ans uh, trying to ask a question of um, which mutations are important for us to look at in this isolate that give it its particular properties, you want to have a smaller set of variants that are specific to that isolate. Um, and the other thing we come across is that annotations are often better for some species than others. Um, a lot of the, um, the need for this project started when we were looking at H37 RB and um, the Beijing reference genomes, where the isolate that we're interested in was more closely related to the Beijing isolate, where H37 RV is the reference genome that is in all the publications, all the databases are based on it. So we were having to align to a genome that was distantly related in, to, in order to get a better annotation information where we wanted to be able to align to a closely related genome so that we can get much better mapping and a much better idea of which variants are important. So why, why do we start looking at graph genomes? Well, from a biological point of view, um, in terms of interpreting the results and scientific questions, it's much easier to um, contextualize variants when you can actually see them according to their relationship to other isolates as well. And I'll, I'll show you a figure demonstrating this a bit later on. Um, also, um, they are much better at capturing the genetic diversity within a population. Um, what this means is that if you have a variant that is found in 80% of a population, you'll find this represented much better in a graph the than graph you, would you would in a single yeah. reference where you're only looking at a single isolate. And it also allows you to always map to the closest available genome, maximizing your alignment, while also having that information from your most publicized and most studied strain still within the same structure. So to kind of get a bit onto the data point of view as well, um, another thing that graph genomes are capable of providing is compression. And this is due to the fact that a lot of the sequences between assets are actually identical. 
um, for humans, it's between 99.9 uh, .9 and 99.5% of the genome, which means that there's a lot of room for compression and removing that redundancy. So now you're starting to work with smaller file sizes, and that's very, very useful in a world where a lot of sequencing is being done and we're generating more and more data. It's also a pre-aligned data structure, which is very useful because the multiple sequence alignment step is a major bottleneck. And if you are able to do this once and then kind of take that aligned file and work with it on your laptop, that, that kind of hard work is already done. So you can do the multiple sequence alignment on the cluster and then work on your graph on a laptop and you, you don't have to redo that multiple sequence alignment every time you have a new um, query that you want to um, ask of your data. Um, and another thing is that graph genomes, as kind of daunting as it sounds, are actually a very intuitive structure. And I'll get to some use cases where uh, I can show this. Um, and they have the potential to replace a lot of the file formats we have, like VCF, um, fast files, um, alignment files, um, and doing so in such a way that you aren't now creating 18 replacements. Um, you're only creating a single replacement, um, and for the most part, using existing file types as well. So what exactly are graph genomes? We've been kind of talking about these for a bit now, and um, just to kind of make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so basically what it is, is a graph, generally speaking, is a combination of nodes and edges, where nodes, represented by these little blue circles over here, represent blocks of sequences, and edges, represented by these black arrows, represent a path from one node to the next. And in this way, you can represent an entire sequence and the relationship of the sequences um, in a structure where you can have multiple paths through these different nodes. Um, over here is just a, a simple example where you've got two genomes. The first one at the top here um, doesn't have a deletion with that C and also has a variant where the G and the A are a mutation. So normally your faster file, your just normal sequence text would have A, C, G, T, A, A, C, T, G, A, and that's fine. And with your other second genome, you'd have the same kind of thing. What the graph version of this would look like is if you took those two genomes and now every sequence that was the same, you just represented in a single node, and then any time there was a mutation, you represented as a little branching off point here, you're now able to represent both of the sequences in one structure, removing the redundancy, but still keeping the information on why the two are different. So the next thing that we're interested in doing is aligning to these graphs. So over here, is an example of just a, a visualized section of a graph. And what the alignment process here looks like is you have your reads shown in red, and you find out where those reads map to this graph structure, the same as you'd map to a reference structure. Now, in this case, you can see that there's almost a particular path. So they're mapping to the part that represents the isolate that these reads are more closely related to. And you can see that over here on this red line that there is this subgraph within the graph genome that represents the isolate that these reads are more closely related to. So without having to go in and know exactly what your isolate is and knowing what the closest um, species you need to align the reads to is, it'll find that best path within a genome and align to it, which maximizes your alignment. Um, where if you only used one of the other references within the graph, a lot more of these reads would be unaligned. Now, there are still some unaligned reads, and what you do with those is you create a new node in the graph, 
that is now specific to that particular isolate and you incorporate that path. So now you've added to the graph, but you've got an entire new genome and only added in one or two extra nodes. So it's actually more a case of you've added all this extra information, but you've done so by actually only adding a couple of differences to the original. You're not having to restore the entire genome. You're just adding the differences specific to that one isolate. And this is very, very useful and very, very powerful in a number of ways. So there's a whole lot of different things you can kind of pull from this alignment. You can find out where different SNPs are. Um, you can identify insertions and it's generally a pretty exhaustive mapping so you're mapping to any available genome which means that if there's a particular insertion that's only specific to one particular isolate that's been sequenced and available on a database and your isolate also has that you will be able to align those reads to that very very unique region which is also useful for um, if you're working with a pan genome, you've got your accessory genome. So this would allow to um, make sure that you also are looking at the accessory genomes of all the different isolates as well. And also gives you a bit more confidence if you find a SNP. So if you find a variant and the quality is low, but you see that, oh wait, there are actually three other organisms that have the same variant in this position, it might give you a bit more confidence that this is real because it is something that exists in the population. There's a number of different structures that have been um, proposed and experimented with for um, graphs, and all of them have different pros and cons, um, and I definitely encourage you to read up on some of the really, really great work that's been done at the moment. Um, the graphs that we uh, wanted to build, though, with GenGraph, have a certain list of desired properties that we wanted to keep though. For example, we wanted them to be very intuitive to use, both because that helps with development um, in terms of when people write more code to kind of add to the code base and write their own tools to kind of use these graphs at their core, but also because it helps a lot with adoption. Um, you don't want someone to have to um, learn some really abstract way of thinking in order to use these graphs. And also, at the end of the day, these are created to allow people to answer biological questions. So we wanted the graphs that we create to be very, very good at intuitively answering biological questions at the end of the day. Because if we have a graph that is so abstract that a researcher can't look at the output and actually understand how this relates to the organism, then it's, it's, it's more of a niche tool then at that point. Um, we also wanted to stick to existing file formats. So no more creating new, um, new weird extensions. Uh, we wanted something that can be used by existing um, tools as well. Uh, we want it to be able to be loaded into um, JavaScript for visualization, or sorry, J, uh, JS for visualization. We want to be able to load it into Cytoscape and all those other things. Um, and we also want it to be modular. So we don't want it to be something that we build today and has certain abilities and it is um, and performs very, very well. But then a month later, a new technology comes out and the entire stack is um, obsolete because there's a particular method so inbuilt that changing that method just breaks everything else. So we wanted to make it modular so you could kind of swap out different parts of it and as different technologies come out, improve it as you go along. And also importantly, we wanted to deal with all forms of variation. So that means also large structural inversions. So not just looking at SNPs or small indels or anything like that. We want to also be able to represent when um, you have for example, a chromosomal inversion or something like that. Um, so yeah, so these were our development goals. Um, compatibility with old formats as well, like GTF. 
And for adoptability, we wrote it in Python because currently that is one of the most widely used languages in the data sciences. And we wanted this to effectively be BioPython, but for graphs. So that same kind of building a number of very, very useful core basic tools and then building on that. So in terms of how GenGraph creates its graphs, um, it has pretty much a three-step method. During the first part is a global alignment method. So on the left there, you can see that there are four genomes and what's been identified there with those three different colors is regions or blocks of sequence that are pretty much the same block of sequence, but not identical. So a couple of mutations here and there, but all in all, that entire structure is the same. For example, you can see in the red block that in the one isolate, that section has undergone an inversion. So that might be 10,000 base pairs of sequence that all the sequence in between those breakpoints is still identical between isolates. It's just been flipped around. So what we use here is a tool like progressive move and that identifies these blocks of sequence. And in the case of the green sequence on the far right there, you can see that sequence is entirely missing in isolate three. So progressive move or any other tool that can identify blocks of sequence like this highlights those blocks and then creates the first iteration of the graph, which is a graph that just has the blocks of sequences that are the same between the organisms. Then it zooms into each of those blocks and we are now at the local alignment step. So now this is where multiple sequence alignment takes place. So we have blocks of sequence that are more or less the same, except for a couple of um, insertions, deletions, mutations here and there. So using a multiple sequence alignment tool like mapped muscle, even crustal omega, um, whatever suits you, you can put in the initial block and do a multiple sequence alignment. Um, you can also just use a already aligned um, sequence file and just skip straight to the step if you want, if you know your sequences don't have any large structural differences. Um, and as you can see over here, within those black squares, those sequences are completely identical. So if you move on to the conversion to a graph step, you can see that all those sections that are completely identical have now just been reduced to a single sequence. And then in the block below that, all the sequences that are identical are represented in a single node and then a path showing the other nodes different sequences at the different positions is now shown. So these little local alignments are then put back into the original graph which has the global blocks and now you have these, now you have this graph that represents both the structural real, uh, rearrangements but also a nucleotide level rearrangement um, and you've got all the sequence that is identical between the isolates summarized in single nodes and part of this modularity is that if someone develops a much better multiple sequence aligner which would then plug into the local alignment step as long as it produces a standard output file, which is just a aligned, aligned faster file or a .alm file, then you can use that tool in the local alignment. So if someone comes up with a really good GPU um, based alignment method, that can be easily plugged into the local alignment and now speed up the creation of the graphs. So this is what we mean in terms of modularity. And it's just the same with the global alignment step. If there's another tool that you prefer to use for global alignment, then you can quite easily just write a small wrapper or ask me, uh, put a request on the GitHub page for a specific tool. Um, we can write a small wrapper for that. It's, it's pretty doable. Um, sure. Uh, let me just have a quick look here. Um, 
Can you see the, the little hand as it's moving on the slides? Or is that just me? No, we can't see it, John. Okay, right, right, right. Um, okay, so I'll use the little pen over here. Um, um, so it's green. I just activated it as a green uh, arrow that you can use, John. Sorry for disturbing. There. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, so yeah. So this section over here, where you have um, your different alignment tools, those can be um, hot swapped in and out as part of the modularity. If you come up with a really, really effective way to do the global alignment step, then you can hot swap that in as well. And um, also, this is important because a lot of the time, certain organisms have very specific alignment tools that are needed. A virus um, in HIV research has got very specific alignment parameters and alignment tools that work much better for them than working with um, a eukaryote or a bacterial genome. Um, yeah, so once you've kind of created this reference structure, it can then be used to uh, create your other graphs, your cactus graphs, your debrain graphs, and we're busy developing that functionality as well to allow you to kind of go from your, um, to go from your gen graph structure into any of the others that you want to work with downstream. So we really want to work on compatibility as well um, because we think that, you know, that's something that's going to be beneficial for everyone and also is essential for the long-term um, usefulness of this project. So in terms of the available functions, we wanted to start off with just, um, just simple things like, uh, where is a specific location in the graph? Um, we need functions that um, extract sequences between point A and point B and can return things like measures of similarity between certain sequences in a region. And by building those simple functions, you can then start to build more complex functions. So your read mapping functions, um, functions to extract a, a pan genome. Um, and we've built a lot of these so far. Um, in terms of read alignment, we're using um, de Bruyne graphs. Um, in terms of um, if you just have a sequence and you want to find out where it maps to the genome and you just have a single sequence, um, one of the students at CBio implemented a um, kind of on-the-fly method that um, scans through the graph creating kamers as it goes and then does a kamer based alignment as well um, and then also uh, doing read alignment by a kind of decompose and map method where um, you take the graph and then you load it into um, memory as a de Bruyne graph and then you can take all your sequences from multiple sequence alignment and align it very quickly against that using um, hashing um, which is uh, fairly quick. Um, so the other functions that we are, uh, have made available is um, being able to <clears throat> incorporate, incorporate variants into the graph. So if you already have um, a VCF file where you've done variant calling against a particular reference, you can then go to your graph if it contains that reference as well as well and take those mutations and incorporate them into your graph as well. Um, also this functions for homology comparisons so to kind of say um, if you have a GTF file you can uh, if you have a GTF file for multiple genomes within the graph um, it can use the positions in the GTF file to extract regions, um, extract subgraphs representing those genes across the different isolates and then compare them by looking at the structure of the graph, so not just at a, a sequence level. Um, and also uh, just for looking at the conservation of sequences. So 
Um, that's as simple as looking at um, if you have a very, very large node in the graph that contains a very, very long sequence, then you know that's an interesting feature, especially if you have 100 genomes in the graph and all 100 of them have this particular 10 KB region that contains no variance. So simply by iterating through the graph and saying, give me any node that's longer than this, or just saying, give me all the nodes but ranked by how long they are. Um, so these functions have been um, actually quite easy to code because of the intuitive nature of the graph, because a long node that contains all the isolates represents a sequence that is conserved, and that's a pretty reasonable um, logical assumption to make. So an example here is a function that uh, what it's trying to do is just kind of like, okay, um, let's find out how similar this region is or this isolate to the other uh, to the other isolates in the graph. So over here, you've got your input graph on the left. And the first step you're going to do is just ask which nodes contained the required region. So um, what get region similarity does is it identifies the nodes where the start and the stop um, region is specified. And these are the same start and stop coordinates that you'd have in a GTF file that would um, relate directly back to what you'd see in a faster file. So um, if on a database you know that this gene position is between X and Y, then you can extract it based on those coordinates within the graph. So that start and stop over here, that's referring to a normal base coordinate system. And then you just say which isolate you're referring to when you're talking about those start and stop, because obviously a start and a stop in one isolate will be different to another isolate. So by specifying your start and stop, you're able to extract a particular subregion from the graph. And then once you've kind of identified those two nodes where that start and stop ends, you can extract all the paths that link those nodes. And so over here we can see that these are all the paths that allow you to get from this node over here to that node over there. Now, looking at the subgraph, you can start to calculate similarity. So if the green points over here were your query sequence that you initially put in, so let's call that isolate, isolate one in this case is your reference. You can kind of say, okay, right, well, isolate one shares maybe all four nodes with isolate three, if isolate three also follows this exact same path. But this isolate over here, this first one, only shares one, two, three of the nodes. So that means that it's a bit less similar than this isolate that would also follow this path over here. And then the isolate that just kind of takes this entire different branch point would be the most distantly related, only sharing two of the nodes. So in a very intuitive way, once again, you can kind of see how similar sequences are by how many nodes they share within a subgraph. Um, you can then translate that to things like um, bit scores by saying, um, based on the length of the sequences in the node, how many, uh, sequ uh, how many nucleotides are shared. Um, and also, uh, most of the time when we're talking about phylogenetics, what we're interested in is evolutionary events. So if a single nucleotide is mutated, it's, you know, one event, a mutation has happened. But if 10,000 base pairs of a genome disappears all at once, that is still just one event. That is still just one thing that happened, though the probability of it happening is, is very, very different. Um, what looking at things at a graph level does is it summarizes differences between the genomes as biological events. But then you can 
kind of go back and calculate and maybe weight um, certain events based on things like the length of the sequence and any other information you have. Um, but you can almost start to kind of say um, the genomes that are most similar are the ones that share the most nodes to one another. And you can build a distance matrix based on that and get an idea of the phylogeny of the sequences as well. Um, now, early on, I also mentioned um, file formats and size. So um, in terms of sticking with only for, uh, file formats that exist, so because GenGraph is pretty much um, an extension of a Python tool called Network X, any export format available to Network X is available to GenGraph. So that means you can export in JSON format, XML format, GraphML format, and any, any function that's available to Network X is also available to the GenGraph graph, which means that you can also iterate through nodes. So for node in graph, you can, you can do that. Um, and in terms of the size, well, we, we did a bit of, um, uh, testing and we found out that um, the size of the output file depends on certain things like the sequence redundancy, the isolate similarity, and so over here in this graph what we see is that so at the bottom here we have the number of sequences in the graph so as you add more sequences the file size increases so um, this initial file size over here um, this was just a very, very small graph for kind of testing purposes. So this is just maybe 120 bytes, let's say. So a single sequence, 120 bytes. Adding on another sequence only adds that little bit of extra file size. Now, these different colors over here represent the sequence similarity. So what we did is we simulated mutations at different rates in the sequence. And as you have higher dissimilarity between the assets within the graph, you start to lose that compression because you're starting to store those differences. So at, so at your kind of higher mutational rates, you, you don't get this compression, but for the majority of bacterial and human genomes um, and closely related organisms, you see pretty good um, results in terms of really, really small file sizes. The more genomes you add, the file size really doesn't increase that much, but your information density does. Um, what this does mean is that working with viral genomes, this, this, you, know, you, you lose your, uh, your compression when working with viral genomes. Um, HRV, sequences loaded into a graph format is definitely not going to save you much space, but it's still usable. Um, but yeah, definitely not for compression purposes. Um, now, in terms of uh, using GenGraph, um, there's three different options to set it up. There's information on the wiki on um, GitHub, and there's three different routes you can take, either through Docker Hub, Python Package Index, or PIP and just literally getting it direct from GitHub if you want to really get into the code. Um, so the simplest way for you to right now sit down and create a genome graph is to use Docker Hub. So this command over here, if you, the only thing you need to install is Docker. So you install Docker, it's got a, you know, easy to download, executable. And if you put in this command Docker run, and then, so what this does is it mounts the directory where your input files are, and you only have one input file. Um, mounts wherever you want your output files to go, as well as where your genomes that you're using are. The name of the Docker Hub um, repository, and then the command make genome graph. This over here specifies the sequence file, so it's just a text file that contains the um, paths to the sequences that you're working with, a out file name, and the out file path in which case is genome. So what this will do is 
all your requirements, all the, your dependencies are all within this Docker container. It'll pull that container from Docker Hub. It'll run the make genome graph command within um, GenGraph, and it will export that created graph genome into this genomes folder over here. So using this, you don't have to worry about installing Move or um, Maft or anything like that. Um, you can just type this in once Docker is installed and create a genome graph. Um, yeah. So in terms of once you've created the graph and you want to start kind of playing around with it and manipulating it, it's available on PIP. So type in pip install gengraph and you've got gengraph installed. No worrying about compiling things or weird dependencies. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward, which, you know, once again, that's part of the design to make sure it's very accessible. And then if you want to start creating new functions and contribute, which I really, really encourage, git clone, and then pip install the requirements. I think there's only two requirements and you're good to go. So just using GenGraph, I just want to show some example code of what this would look like. So um, importing a created genome is as simple as um, importing GenGraph and then um, doing import GenGraph graph and then the name of the XML file. And now you've got a loaded graph object. And you can check which isolates are within the graph object by doing graph object.ids. Okay, so there's a W148 isolate and H37RD isolate within this one. And now you just want to extract a particular region. Say there's a particular gene that you want to see if it's there. This is a very small gene. You just say between position here and here for this particular isolate, give me that subsequence. And voila you've got that subsequence. The same way that you'd work almost with a um, faster file object. If you wanted to extract a subregion graph, then exactly the same kind of thing. You use your um, get region graph, oh, ignore the self here, um, the region start, region stop, the sequence name, which would be H37RV here, and then the neighbors. So what the neighbors is, is um, if you're extracting a subgraph, you might also want to get all the nodes that are just either side of it or um, or kind of branching out in between those two nodes. Um, and that allows you to get that information as well. And then using Network X write GML, you can then write that subgraph. And here's just a quick example of visualizing it. You can literally take that file, load it into Cytoscape, which is freely available, and you can start playing around with visualizations. So this is a genome graph that's just a hairball. Um, you'll see a lot of those. But here's a particular region that's been extracted where you can see I've sized the, the nodes to be the same width depending on how much sequence is in them. So what it's showing is that um, there's a little bit of sequence in the beginning, a small little snip, a whole lot of sequence, and then uh, these are just the borders of the region that was extracted. So I can just visualize the fact that the variant is towards the front of this particular gene. And over here, I can see that it is a C to T mutation, where it is a T in h 37 rb and a C in W148. So yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and the thing is, is you, when I talked about contextualization earlier, this is what I mean, where normally if you do variant calling, you've got your reference and you've got your isolate, and you don't actually have any information about which is the ancestral version of a mutation, for example. Where over here, we can see that there's been an A to G mutation, but only CDC1551 has this A nucleotide at that position, where all three other isolates have the G sequence. So this has straight away allowed you to better contextualize what is happening at that position. You're not just looking at um, a reference and your isolate in isolation. You're looking at it in the context to other isolates within the graph, uh, which is very useful for interpretation. Um, you can also use it to do things like extract a pan transcriptome. So by doing something like extracting all the subgraphs for each isolate, comparing them, 
and then kind of giving a one or zero whether or not it passes a similarity threshold, you can then start extracting all the genes that are um, common between isolates and accessory genes, and we're busy working on functions to allow you to do that. Um, and what then what that allows you to then do is to take your accessory genome and align your reads specifically um, <laughs> accessory genome, and then judging by where the majority of the reads aligns, you can identify um, which isolate your isolate is most closely related to. Um, we've managed to publish this work. It is available on BMC Bioinformatics. So I, I welcome you to have a read there on that. And I'd like to thank um, everyone else involved in the project, Nicola Mulder um, for her support, um, Shandakani for the work that she's done on developing some of the functions, as well as Campbell Green, who helped with the read alignment aspect of, um, of this project with um, aligning single uh, reads to the graph. Um, Yes, uh, thank you everyone for your time. I hope this has been uh, interesting and yeah, um, open okay. to any questions now. Thank you uh, so, thank so you. much, John. I can actually tell you are a teacher uh, because you were very articulate in your explanations. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's attending as well. Uh, it's time for questions. We have about okay. 10 minutes to go. So if you have any questions, please tap them in the chat box. If you have any comments, you can either raise your hand, as I said, and you can speak. Um, or you can tap them up and John, John will gladly engage with you. So I'm going to give you some time. We have 10 minutes, as I said. So I don't know if it's just me, but I don't see the chat box. I don't know if you moved it. Okay. Yep. Uh, I don't know. I think, Sumi, are you moving the screen? It just vanished for me as well. Um, I, oh, okay. Did you have a question, Sean? Yeah, maybe in the meantime, I'll just ask a question. Uh, thanks, John. It was a great talk. Uh, uh, just practically in terms of scalability, um, when we talk about using gender, do you think that it's something, uh, it's a tool that would be able to be scaled up a while? Practically as it is now, would be able to, uh, to handle whole genomes from human data? Or is that something that uh, that would have to be looked at further? So, in terms of the architecture at the moment, um, there isn't anything that would limit it. Uh, most things tend to be scaling in a linear fashion. So, there's, um, I mean, the the code is in its relatively young stage in terms of the optimization um, rounds. So. For example, I've only just recently implemented um, multi-processing on some of the functions, which has, has seen a massive um, speed uh, improvement. And for the most part, I've been working on bacterial genomes just on my laptop. So um, I think that in terms of scalability, um, there's no apparent reason why it wouldn't. The main reason I haven't been able to test it out extensively on human genomes is because there, though there's a lot of data on human genomes, there's not a lot of fully assembled human genomes um, that are um, available to kind of um, test out and play around with. Um, and another thing that um, I still also need to look at is um, exactly how we want to best deal with um, multiple alleles uh, as, as you'd find in the human genome. Do we have, um, like with chromosomes, a graph for each chromosome or um, you know, how, how best do we, um, do we implement that? And currently we're not locked into any particular direction. Um, so there's a lot of room just to actually play around and okay, see cool. what works. Thanks. We, we, we might try it and we'll, we'll let you know if we manage to break it if we start using some human data. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd really love to hear about all the ways that it breaks. Um, people have started posting stuff on the um, GitHub page and I actually get very excited when I hear about errors because okay, cool. I mean, people are using it and trying to break it. Okay, thank you so much for that, Sean. Sure. Uh, there's a question from Sam who says, do you have a version of 
John got for Windows. John? Yeah. Um, because it's built with um, Python, that means that um, you know Python runs on pretty much any um, any operating system, and also with Docker, it means that um, uh, Docker is pretty much like a virtual uh, machine that you can run anywhere. So if it can, and yeah, so there's really good support for Docker on Windows. So you can always okay, use that. Cool. As well. Thank you. Um, Jaleli Oyalade says, thank you for the beautiful presentation. My question is on flight 23. Must we first convert the sequence from global alignment to local alignment before the conversion to graph? Thank you. Um, and there's a question also from JTB, which I'm not clear on, but please answer the question from Jaleli first, and then we can address the other one. So um, all that gets taken care of by the pipeline. So the only input you need is um, the original faster genome files. So uh, yeah, literally just genome.fa and it takes care of the global alignment and local alignment and conversion and everything else. Um, but it does allow you to provide an already aligned um, set of sequences and convert that to a graph. So both functionality is available. Um, from JTB, how uh, working with uh, huge transposons in the genome. So when it comes to transposons and your repetitive sequences, um, there's, there, there's two things that come in there. First of all, is it, it will be reliant on um, how the alignment tools deal with transposable elements. So if you have, um, if you decide to use a, a alignment tool that is prone to misinterpret them, then that will be carried into the graph. And you know this is one of the reasons why we want it to be module, uh, modular. If there are tools that are better than um, progressive mode or anything else of dealing with um, things like transposons, we want to be able to incorporate those tools and still have everything run um, the same way and not kind of break the entire flow. Um, but for the most part, um, it deals well with, uh, with aligning because you're now looking at uh, aligning a large structure of the genome. You're not just looking at um, a thousand base pair region. Um, these blocks over here in the global alignment, they can be um, there can be tens of thousands of base pairs, which means that even with the huge transposon, um, you can, the alignment tools will be able to anchor its position based on unique sequence, maybe flanking that transposable element. Um, though transposons are often found at breakpoints. Um, yeah, so transposons are always an issue, but for the most part, we haven't seen it directly break anything. And by improving the tools that we use for global alignment and local alignment, um, as we improve those, we'll be better capable of dealing with transversal elements. Okay, thank you so much, John. I see Olivier is typing. Um, JTB says thank you. Uh, you don't have to type. You can actually also raise your hand and speak. But I see Olivier's question who's asking, can nodes be misaligned? John? So they can be misaligned if the alignment tool that you use misaligns them. So if MAFT or muscle or CLUSLO misalign something, then yes, it will be misaligned. So um, in that way, you know, it's, it's the same as doing any alignment. You need to um, maybe uh, for a particular organism fine tune the parameters that MAFT or whatever it is that you're using to make sure that you get an accurate alignment as possible. Um, but for the most part, um, if you have uh, if you have very, very um, diverse genomes, um, you can still rely on the regions that are identical to be identical for the most part. But yeah. Um, your misalignment will be um, dependent on how well 
um, how well these tools perform. Um, by misaligned, you mean creating a new node or is there any kind of threshold to build new ones? Um, so with GenGraph, any sequence within a node implies that it is definitely the same sequence between isolates. So anytime there's uncertainty in a region, so um, if you have an area of say maybe uh, 20 nucleotides where you're not entirely sure um, based on a whole lot of gaps where those nucleotides align to one another, they might be represented then as just two entirely separate nodes. Um, so as much as possible, we want it to be um, biologically accurate. So um, if we are unable to properly align a region, then rather just keep it as two separate nodes. And so the information is still there and the graph is just saying, yeah, the sequences are there, but we don't know how they relate to one another. So that's one way of kind of um, dealing with nodes that just don't align properly. Okay, thank you so much, John. Uh, we have two minutes left. So I'm gonna ask that you rush to ask your questions, but if you don't have a question now, you can always uh, email John. He won't mind to plan to your email. Or you can follow him on Twitter at Jamla24 uh, to engage with him on whatever he discussed today or other bioinformatics topics that you want to talk to him about. I'm just going to give a few more minutes to see if we have any other questions. Mohammed has a question uh, from UFK, uh, University of uh, Khartoum. How hard is for node alignment to be parallelized? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's luckily very um, straightforward. I'm actually busy working on that at the moment. Um, so because each uh, node is uh, realigned um, separately and not dependent on the others, you, you can pretty much farm it out to as many cores as you have available to you. Um, so yeah, uh, the multiprocessing is, like I say, it's, it's part of the performance enhancements that I'm busy working on at the moment. Um, we've already added um, parallelization to um, KMA creation for alignment. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not too hard to, to para, uh, para, parallel allies. That one. There seems to be one more question, I think. Uh, okay. With, say, the African population, which is said to have a lot of variations, can't we have complex graph with a lot of nodes that may be difficult to handle? Yes, yeah, um, and you know that is one of the applications that um, I really, really want to build towards is making sure that we can handle um, kind of human level variation between very distantly related populations. So my answer to that question is that there is, like I say, no logical or no apparent reason why it would not be able to to deal with that but of course testing and trying to break it is required it also comes down to the alignment methods at the end of the day so we might have to test a couple of different alignment methods and different parameters until we... Davis asks, I think following from what Howard was talking about, do you know if anyone else is working on building that? Yeah, yeah. Um, H3 Africa are working on building a, uh, a African graph reference genome, actually. Um, and the other groups, uh, there's one called Seven Bridges as well, um, that are working on a human reference graph. Um, so there's a lot of proje uh, projects working towards building um, human reference graphs, um, but a lot of the software is um, human specific. And um, for example, the Seven Bridges software, a lot of that is also proprietary and not open source. Um, so you know, one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that this, uh, the tool we're developing is not specific for one particular organism and freely available and, um, 
usable in Python to allow people to um, develop their own tools easily and allow for adoption. Um, yeah, so there are other groups working on building that. And uh, yeah, and I think hopefully there'll be a H3 Africa talk on the African uh, human uh, graph genome soon. If it has not already been on recently. Yes, many more people are typing. Uh, David, uh, how do you deal with reads preferring to align to two isolates instead of only one? Um, so how do you mean preferring to align to two isolates instead of one? Um, do you mean as in, um, sorry, I'm just trying to, uh, as in preferring to align to a path, a path in the genome where the nodes are, belong to multiple isolates? Um, let's just see if I can find a, a slide that might. David, you can it. also like uh, uh, speak if you can to clarify what your question so, is. So, so for example, um, if you have this red path over here, where actually. Um, 10 out of 12 isolates all have this genome structure versus maybe other isolates that have a genome structure that follows this kind of path. Um, there won't be any bias because it, it doesn't weight the alignment based on how many isolates are found within each node. It just looks at the sequences of the nodes and says, where is the best match? Where does this align where I need to have the, the fewest mutations? So um, for example, let me just use the drawing tool. Um, if by aligning along this path over here, um, it has to incorporate maybe a, um, a mutation to um, based on that node, um, if it can also align to this, but without having to do any mutations, and that's a perfect alignment, then it will always take this path. So um, with the alignment, it tests the alignment over every possible path through the graph. Um, so um, you're always trying to find the optimal alignment looking at every single option. So if you have an A in a T at a position, and in your isolate, you have a T at that position, it'll align to that particular path. Okay, thank you so, so much, John, uh, and thank you so much to all our attendees for your engagement, for your many questions. Um, I see that there's a lot of people that still want to ask you something, so please email John. I'll pro provide you with his email address. I'll provide you with the slides, and as I said, I was recording this meeting, so I'll also provide um, the recording link once we put it up on our YouTube channel. Um, John, thank you so much for such an engaging and informative webinar and I hope to have you in future for one of our webinars or other workshops um, at the Shri Bayonet. We appreciate it. Everybody's saying thank you so much for a great presentation and I agree with them. So John, any last words? Okay. Oh, thank you again. Um, just thank you again for hosting me and thank you for um, the great introduction and uh, emceeing this webinar. And yeah, thank you again, everyone. Please um, message me with any questions. Um, let me know if you want to get involved, if you want to write some code. If there's something you don't like, <laughs> then definitely come and write some code. Um, okay, sure. Thank yeah. you, John. Uh, uh, see everybody in, in May for the next webinar. But for now, follow John, as I said, on Twitter. Email him and engage him. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day, everybody. Goodbye.